Today, we're going to talk about cosmology. Cosmology talks about not just the origin of our observable universe, but its current state and its possible future. Entailed in some of these notions about the way the universe is are some notions that are almost philosophical regarding whether or not it's reasonable to consider that there are other universes or that, uh, that our universe may be, uh, has aspects that forever will lay beyond our ability to measure or interact. So today, we're going to talk about those things, the history of the universe. What does the universe have a shape? Where did our universe start? When will it end? And could there be more than one universe? So in the beginning, one of my favorite books to talk about the beginning is, uh, is one from which I've drawn much of the content of this particular talk. Uh, it's a relatively recent book. It's called A Universe from Nothing by this fellow, Lawrence Krauss. And uh, his main supposition is that the Big Bang began as a quantum jitter or a wiggle, we, you may remember we've talked about quantum mechanics, uh, that the Big Bang be began, our universe began, as a improbable, but given enough time, absolutely certain fluctuation in some larger or meta context of uh, quantum mechanical uncertainty and uh, energy flux fluctuation. The other thing implied by much recent thinking and some research in physics is that the total energy of the universe, if you add in the, uh, the, the sort of negative potential energy due to gravity and the positive energy due to all the stuff that is in our universe, is that if you add all those things up, the total energy of our universe is exactly zero, which is mind-boggling because Certainly, as we go about our regular days, we see that energy is important to us, and we see that energy exists around us. But in the larger cosmic scale, energy is likely conserved, and that conservation leads us to believe that the Big Bang instantiated our visible universe with zero total energy. So I want to talk about the first 300 80,000 years of the universe. At the beginning of the known time period after the Big Bang, and, and a little bit of a clarification, the Big Bang, the science that tells us what happened uh, during and after the Big Bang can only go back so far. And that so far is really far. It's about 10 to the minus 43, so that's uh, uh, 40 a point zero 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 forty three zeros and then a one seconds um, from perhaps some instantaneous origin. But it's very possible that whatever nugget instantiated the Big Bang, whatever quantum fluctuation, existed in that state for an indeterminate period of time before the clock started ticking, the clock that gave rise to the physical processes that we can measure. So, 
At some point, relatively early in the history of our universe, relatively soon after that briefest moment, it's pretty certain that all of the forces of nature, and we've talked about all of them during the past few months, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, electromagnetism and gravity, were all essentially manifestations of one single underlying interaction that is fundamental to nature. Similarly, it is believed that many of the particles, or it's expected that many of the particles and forces of nature and the particles that convey those forces of nature were also unified as a single manifestation of a very, uh, very exotic form of energy that we have yet to detect. The general idea is that early, again, early in the universe's history, um, mere fractions of a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the forces of nature and the constituents of matter and energy were united into one single manifestation. This is a picture we've seen before. This is a picture of the baby universe. So as we covered during our discussion about the Big Bang, as you look out in space, you are also looking back in time. And we can look back into the history of the universe right up until the point when the universe was about 380,000 years old. Up until that point, the universe was essentially a hot plasma, and it was opaque. Light, which is the primary mechanism in all of its different forms that we use to understand the nature of the cosmos and the things that comprise it. Light was essentially trapped by a sea of charged particles until about 380,000 years after that first calculable moment of the Big Bang. When we look out into the sky and we use microwave telescopes, so microwaves are just another form of light, we see this picture throughout the sky. You see that it's a bit grainy. Those grainy spots correspond to slightly warmer or slightly cooler places in the sky. One of the things you'll notice is that the graininess is relatively evenly distributed. Another thing that's interesting is that there is graininess to start with. We talked about some of that in our Big Bang uh, discussion, how that graininess arose most certainly from quantum fluctuations that pro uh, produced small little bumps in energy, bumps and dips in energy, that then expanded as the universe expanded and became the seeds, the nucleation seeds, if you will, around which gravity was able to condense stars and gas and galaxies. In the 13.82, that's the latest, greatest calculation of the age of our universe, uh, going back to that uh, brief moment <clears throat> that we can discern, in the 13.82 billion years since the universe was initiated, we have seen matter come into existence. We've seen whirls of galaxies come into existence. Some of them were quasars earlier in their lifetime and emitted copious amounts of searing radiation. The stars that have come and gone, we've talked about that, how they formed the different matter constituents that we see around us, all 92 naturally occurring elements were forged in the heart of stars, or, as we discovered when we talked about gold, were created when two neutron stars came together. So stellar processes and stellar nucleosynthesis is responsible for all of the matter that we see around us. And as one author says, I think it was actually Stephen Krauss in his book, that the carbon atoms in your left hand and the carbon atoms in your right hand likely came from different stars. Uh, we are quite literally made of, as Carl Sagan famously said, star stuff. The universe also continues to expand. One of the questions that you might reasonably ask about a thing that's expanding is what shape does it have? We talked about this a little bit in our Big Bang discussion. Scientists like to give names and mathematical symbols 
to different aspects of nature. The symbol indicating the curvature of space is omega. That's what this little horseshoe-shaped Greek letter is. And different overall shapes of the universe correspond to different values of omega. If omega is greater than, or isn't it, yeah, greater than one, then it's a spherical universe. If it's less than one, it's something called a hyperbolic universe, which is kind of saddle-shaped. And there's a special case, given all the possible shapes that the universe could be, imagine how many numbers are bigger than one, right? There's an infinite number of them. Imagine how many fractions are smaller than one. Again, there's an infinite number of possibilities. Sitting in the middle between those possibilities is a precise exact number, 1.0000, etc. That's a single unique value that corresponds exactly and only to the special case that the universe, the overall shape of the universe, is flat, like a plane, like Euclidean geometry. What's the implications of this? Well, the implications of this is if you shine two parallel light beams, if you have, uh, I've got one laser pointer here, if I had another one and I shone another light parallel to this one, only in a flat universe will those laser beams never meet. In a spherical universe, it would be like standing in Cuba and standing in Egypt and shining a light towards the North Pole, at the North Pole they would meet. Parallel lines intersect in a spherical universe. In a hyperbolic universe, the saddle shape, the last picture there, if you shine two parallel light beams, they will diverge over time. They will get further and further apart. Well, this aspect of nature allows for a particular kind of experiment. We can actually see what happens to light beams over cosmic distances. Remember, the light that comes, comes from the baby picture of the universe has traveled about 13 billion light years. That's a long way. That's a lot of time for those light, light beams to either diverge or to converge. So we can use the cosmic microwave background radiation and the light that it has emitted billions of years ago. We can measure that light here in our tiny little planet to discover the geometry of the universe. I should qualify that, the geometry of the observable universe. We'll talk about perhaps what may not be observable in the near future. One of the things that you determine when you are a cosmologist and a physicist and you do the appropriate calculations, remember that the cosmic microwave background radiation was created when the universe was 380,000 years old. That's about 360,000 years. That means that light had had about 360,000 years to travel around, to communicate between different parts of the universe. And also, um, there's 360 degrees in a circle. So they're roughly equivalent. If you take one degree of a patch of sky from the cosmic microwave background, and you look at it carefully, here we are on Earth staring out at the night sky, and we're going to pick a small patch, and we're going to measure the size of the clumps. Remember, in order for any signal to instigate physical interactions in our universe, that signal must necessarily propagate at or less than the speed of light. We talked about that in our lecture regarding relativity. So this side of the universe, in order to be similar to this side of the universe, at some point had to be in contact. But during the inflationary epoch of the Big Bang, which I'm not going to talk about in detail today, we covered that several months ago in the, uh, uh, in the Big Bang talk. During the inflationary epoch, these parts of the universe on this side and on this side were hurled away from each other by virtue of the space in between them expanding. So we know that at some point, the graininess, the scale of the graininess of the universe is dictated by the speed of light and what that says about whether or not 
the gravity or any other force of those various clumps has had time to interact with each other. So you can make a triangle, or in another sense, you can measure the size of the clumps in the picture of the early Big Bang. And we have uh, several satellites that have allowed us to do that. The most recent one is called the Planck satellite. And that satellite measures that one degrees. It knows that it's about 13 billion light years away. And it can measure the size of those clumps to make sure that none of those clumps is larger than one degree. When they do that, when you look at this 13 billion year old baby picture of the universe and you determine whether the light that was emitted by the universe at this time has diverged or converged over time to tell us the shape of the overall universe, you find that the picture returned by the satellites is to the best of our ability to measure in perfect agreement with a perfectly flat cosmos. Remember how special that is. Of all the possible values, an infinitude of values, either less than one or greater than one, that could characterize the curvature of our universe, it turns out that the universe has exactly flat uh, geometric aspect. Well, one of the things that has been invoked to explain this is the theory of inflation, not monetary inflation, but cosmic inflation, that occurred shortly after the Big Bang, where the universe increased by orders of magnitude in a tiny fraction of a second. If you take any kind of curved surface, imagine a baseball blown up to the size of, let's say, this planet. Well, it's perfectly reasonable on modest scales to assume that we live in a flat world because all the curvature has been essentially squeezed out by virtue of expansion. <coughs> if we were instead to be on uh, whatever might be considered the surface of Jupiter, the visible surface of Jupiter, then the radius of curvature of that planet is much larger and the horizon would be even further away and it would even better approximate a perfectly flat area. If you do that kind of inflating to a gigantic size across the whole universe, then no matter where you are, you're likely to measure, as far as you can see, a flat universe. So one of the nice things about the idea of inflation, cosmic inflation, is that it drove the universe, no matter how it started initially, it drove our observable universe towards a state of having perfectly flat curvature. There are other implications of the inflationary epoch as well. Uh, the, the fact that no matter where we look in the sky, we see similar stuff. Uh, the fact that those small quantum fluctuations that gave rise to the hot and cold spots in the baby picture of our universe were blown up by inflation, expanded by cosmic inflation to the point where they became uh, galaxy clusters and clumps of gas. So one of the things that was uh, talked about a uh, time or two ago, and I, I actually have a new shirt to show off. I, I like wearing science shirts. This, uh, <coughs> this shirt was a gift from my partner Dave. It's the punchline for the joke. Why can't you trust an atom? Because atoms make up everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like it, it's pretty funny, and it seems plausible, but in fact, it's absolutely wrong. Atoms don't make up everything. Now, that's not to say that atoms are honest. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> On the other hand, we know that there's a lot of stuff in our visible universe that aren't atoms. There may be things called wimps, Weakly interactive massive particles. Now, I'll leave it to your imagination to decide why a room full of physicists might have come up with that name. 
But these wimps, remember we talked about the weak force. And when we say massive particles, that entails the notion that they interact via gravity. So if you have something in nature that is massive and only interacts via the weak force and gravity, you're not likely to see its weak interactions very often. You may recall we talked a little bit about neutrinos and how neutrinos could go through light years of lead and have about a 50% chance of having interacted with any of the lead along the way. Neutrinos, which only interact via the weak force, almost never actually interact with matter. If you had something kind of like a neutrino, but it had a lot of mass, and it moved relatively slower than the speed of light, so that it was what you might call cold, that's cold, dark matter, then it would have characteristics that we should be able to measure mostly through its impact on gravity. Back in the uh, 30s, I think it was, uh, or 40s, uh, a fellow by the name of Zwicky came up with the notion of dark matter, but his calculations were off, his measurements were wrong. It was up to a lady who came along in the 1970s, Vera Rubin, to very meticulously measure the rotational speeds of the stars that comprise galaxies. And when she did this, she found that there is, if you plot a curve of the expected rotational speed of a galaxy, as you got farther and farther away from the central hub of a spiral galaxy, you would expect the stars in the distant suburbs to rotate and move more slowly. That's one of the lines. That's the line on the graph that dips down. But when she looked at innumerable galaxies and did the measurements, she found that it was more like the top line on the graph. Am I saying that right? Yeah. The top line on the graph where the rotational speed of stars in the galaxy were essentially constant, no matter how far away they were from the center of the galaxy. So she hypothesized that from a gravitational interaction perspective, the only the best plausible explanation for why that occurred was that there was something gravitationally significant that we could not see. It wasn't gas or dust that would reflect starlight. It wasn't stars that obviously make starlight. So what is this stuff? And how much of it is there? Well, it turns out that there's about three times more of this stuff than there is of ordinary matter if you take into account all of the gravitational effects. Now I must admit when I was a student of physics back in the 80s and I first came across this concept I was skeptical. My thinking was thus. What's more likely that the universe has manifested uh, whole lot of energy or, or gravitational effect worth of energy, a gravitational mass, What's, is that likely? Is that likely that, that there's 75% of the universe, the matter in the universe that we've never measured, that I can't move with my hand or see with my eyes? Is that likely? Or is it likely that the equations that we've created as we've explored the cosmos are wrong? Maybe we just don't have the theory of gravity right. To me, that seemed like a more plausible explanation than suddenly inventing two-thirds of the stuff in the universe. But then came the bullet cluster. This is a picture of the bullet cluster. The bullet cluster is a large collection of galaxies that have uh, passed through and interacted with one another. Two, two clusters, as it were. And one of the aspects of gravity that is special is that gravity can act like a big telescope. Gravity bends the light that travels through the affected gravitational field. When you look carefully at the interactions of the two clusters in this bullet cluster, you see that most of the matter, which is the red stuff, it even looks like a little bit of a shock wave, like you fired one thing through another. When you measure the visible matter, the, the, the various microwaves and infrared radiation, etc., that tell you where the matter is, 
And then you do something different. Then you look at the way gravity bends starlight around these, these two clusters, one of which is passed through the other. You see that the bending of starlight unambiguously tells you that there's a huge amount of mass that was essentially left behind or that raced ahead, that wasn't interacting with the matter in the other cluster. So it didn't get slowed down like that red bow shock that you see on the, uh, on the right. That invisible matter, which is detected by gravitational curvature, gravitational lensing, is the blue stuff in the picture. Now that's not a real picture of the dark matter. The blue is not light that was emitted by dark matter. It's, it was painted by a computer program that showed where the dark matter must likely be. Once the bullet cluster and the evidence that the bullet cluster conveyed came to light, as it were, um, I really had no option other than to change my mind. And that's one of the lessons of science in general, is a willingness to change one's mind. You contrast that with dogmatic truths that say this is the way it is, this is the way it's always been, this is the way it will be. Science never says that. All the truths in science are provisional. Every potential explanation we have for the way the world is, is a theory. But it's not a theory in the context of some wild hypothesis, typically. Unless you're talking about string theory. I won't get into that. A scientific theory is a set of models that provide both an explanation and a prediction about the world itself. And the theory of gravity that Newton came up with was very accurate on most scales that we interact with day to day. It's so accurate, in fact, that Newton's theory of gravity can clearly specify how to get a probe from here to slingshot around the sun, to whirl a little bit about Mercury, to zoom out to Jupiter, and then to be launched in a very clearly calculated trajectory to Pluto. Later this summer, a probe for which Newton's gravitational equations were used to define its trajectory, a probe will approach Pluto in July. I plan on having a uh, Pluto party, maybe at my house, maybe somewhere else. Keep an eye on Meetup for that, our first close-up view of Pluto, by virtue of appeal to Newton's theory of gravity. And then Einstein came along in the early 1900s, about 100 years ago, and said, well, there's some few places and circumstances where Newton's gravity doesn't quite work. So I'm going to tweak it a little bit. Does that make Newton's theory of gravity wrong? Well, that's an interesting philosophical question. We still use it practically to send probes out to Pluto. Is it wrong? It may not be the best theory and the best mathematical framework to apply in all circumstances. When you get extreme circumstances like the bullet cluster, then you may need some other theory that takes into account exotic phenomena. And all theories in science are provisional, but that doesn't mean they're bad, and it doesn't mean that they're wrong, and it doesn't mean that you can decide not to believe in them because you don't like them. I accepted the reality of dark matter because I was shown evidence. Talking about this guy, so we had a conversation back in December or so about mathematics. And there are a lot of times when mathematics will tell us that something is mathematically correct, but it's hard to make sense of that in a physical context. You may remember solving quadratic equations. Um, I, was, I had an opportunity to help with that recently. And remember the roots of a quadratic equation? Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. All right? Yeah, yeah. I see a lot of groans. <clears throat> well, you know that plus or minus in there? Negative b plus or minus the square root of a bunch of garbage, ah, a bunch of 
terms. A lot of times when we're solving equations and solving physical processes that, that require us to use that formula, we throw out either the plus or the minus part because it gives what's called an unphysical result. So the result that it tells us doesn't make any sense in the context of the problem. So at that juncture, we know that the math is telling us something nonsensical and we just ignore it. Well, Einstein did something similar. He came up with the mathematics that described gravity and he had an extra term left over. And one of the things that he had was a prejudice similar to mine. He believed, and again, this was a belief based not on evidence, but on a predisposition that the universe was static and unchanging. And Einstein imposed his belief onto the mathematics and says, in order for my equations of gravity to tell me how the universe really is shaped and how it works, I need to assume that this value has a particular numeric representation other than zero. So I'm going to invent something to add to my math to support my prejudice that the universe is static and unchanging. And that thing was called the cosmological constant. Just a couple years later, Edwin Hubble, by virtue of research into the way galaxies that are far away from us seem to be moving, and in fact, the notion that the further away, the faster they seem to be moving, that put the lie to the idea that the universe was static and unchanging. Galaxies were moving away, and they were moving away from us in every direction. Now, that actually makes sense if you think about a complex uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a more uh, geometrically um, interesting manifold than just our simple three dimensions, if you think about a four-dimensional manifold. And again, we talked about that during the Big Bang lecture, how you can, no matter where you are in space, you will see all the galaxies rushing away from you. I'm happy to, recover, to cover that again if people have questions later. But the, the science and the evidence and unambiguously pointed to the fact that the universe was changing. It was not static. So Einstein dropped that term that he had introduced into his equations, the cosmological constant, and he called it his biggest blunder. The biggest blunder was the notion that he could have predicted that the universe was changing, that it was a dynamic system and not a static system, and he didn't. He didn't believe what the math was telling us. So we have two different cases. We have times when the math tells us something that we think is ridiculous, and so we discard it. And we have other times where the math tells us something, and it's brand new. It allows us to go out and take a fresh assessment of the way the universe really works and see if what the mathematics is telling us is really able to be measured. And in many cases, and especially the cases for quantum mechanics, I'll allude to that a little bit later, um, it turns out that the math is more accurate than our biases, or even than our imagination about what's really happening. Sometimes asking that question cannot be answered unequivocally from a philosophical standpoint, but mathematically it's quite clear. It turns out that there is, in fact, a value for the cosmological constant. And that value is what is responsible for the continued expansion of space in between all the galaxies. Now, one of the questions, I was at the Adler Planetarium, I just happened to be visiting there the other day, um, about a year ago, and uh, there was a, a talk about the Big Bang, and somebody had a question about well, if space is expanding, then why isn't everything in our solar system expanding? Why aren't we getting further away from the sun? And perhaps even more interesting than that, why aren't I expand? Well, I may be expanding, but <laughs> you know what I mean, right? Why doesn't everything in the universe expand if the whole universe is expanding? Well, it turns out that the gravitational field between massive things like stars and planets is stronger than the 
impelling force introduced by the cosmological constant. The cosmological constant, if it were, insofar as it's a gravitational effect, is about equal to the mass of one hydrogen atom per cubic meter, if not less. It's a very, very tiny effect. But the thing is, that effect causes the space in between objects that gravitate together, it causes the space in between to expand when gravity between uh, distant objects is relatively weak. Similarly, your body is held together and asteroids are held together by um, electromagnetic forces. And the electromagnetic forces in the atoms of your body are much stronger than the impelling force of the cosmological constant. But the cosmological constant's value can be thought of as negative energy. And that's why the total energy of the universe in some way can be negative. But if you sum up this negative energy and you just want to measure its magnitude, and you compare that to the magnitude of all the mass and all the dark matter that we know exists in our universe, you find out that most of the total energy that comprises our observable universe is explained by dark energy. Why isn't it zero? Why does it have the value it has? Nobody has any good ideas yet. What is dark matter? People have some ideas, whether they're good or not remains to be seen, and it remains to be validated by evidence. There's some recent observations that hint that dark matter might be clumping near our galactic center and perhaps um, dark matter annihilates with itself and creates a kind of gamma ray background. But that's all still fairly speculative. We don't really know what dark matter is. One of the jobs of the Large Hadron Collider in Europe is to try and create particles of dark matter. Now we won't see them directly, but what we will potentially see is energy that just vanishes from the interaction that they're measuring in some new and unexplicable, otherwise unexplicable way. So that's why this shirt and that joke is lying. You know, you can't trust atoms because they make up everything. Actually, they make up very little. They're, actually, they're, they're quite believable. <laughs> All of the matter in the, in the uh, gas and dust and stars in the universe make up about 4% of the total mass energy allocated to our visible universe. I mean, nobody expected that. Talk about changing your mind because the evidence leads you to create new theories. That's one of the things I love about science is that I can be indeterminate. I, I tend to be this way in my personal life anyway. Where would you like to go? Well, I don't know. Science is always provisional. It's a perfect career for somebody who's a little wishy-washy. <clears throat> Pardon me. Pardon me. In any regards, we see that the cosmos has surprised us with what it's comprised of. Dark matter and dark energy, who ordered that? And yet the evidence tells us that they are there. Most recently, a fairly interesting discovery has been made using something called a standard candle. The idea is that there are certain processes that occur in the universe that give rise to a highly predictable um, set of visible phenomena. One of these is when there's a white dwarf around a large star. The white dwarf sucks matter off of the large star by virtue of gravity. And at some point, the mass that accumulates on that white dwarf star becomes so great that the white dwarf blows itself up as a supernova. Those are called type 1a supernovas, and they have a very characteristic light signature. You can use that characteristic light signature to see how far away things are by looking at how they're redshifted, how their light is stretched out by virtue, by virtue of the motion of these stellar pairs. And there's something very interesting that has been discovered recently. If Hubble was perfectly correct, and that the rate of expansion of the universe is relatively constant, then the further away you look in space, that's this dotted line here that you might just barely be able to see. The further you look out into space, then 
there should be a linear relationship to how far away something is compared to how fast it seems to be moving away from us. But when the data comes in, it actually plots this black line up top, which is just ever so slightly different than the 45 degree dotted line. Again, the data is surprising us. And what is this data telling us? It's telling us that the rate of expansion of the universe has been increasing throughout the history of the universe. And that has some profound implications we'll talk about in a moment. I want to take a moment uh, as an interesting aside. As we're measuring the light and the things that we see in the universe, there was something back in, I believe, 1991 called the Oh My God particle. So what was the Oh My God particle? It was a particle, you've heard of cosmic rays, we talked about that uh, a couple times ago. Cosmic ray was are, are generally um, uh, created by physical processes somewhere around black holes or quasars or God knows what. So we ended up with a particle detector set somewhere on a mountain that, de that detected a particle with 320 eta electron volts. That's about 40 million times more energy than particles that can be produced in the Large Hadron Collider. It's a tremendously energetic particle. And ever since then, there have been several other particles discovered with around uh, 60 at an electron volts, very few that have had higher energy than that. And one of the reasons for that is relativity. This is a good opportunity to talk about relativity and its impact on cosmological scales. Remember the microwave background radiation? Also recall relativity. As you move faster relative to some <clears throat> stationary observer, you will see what's called a blue shift. If you move faster towards a source of light, you will see that source of light shifting higher and higher in its frequency to where red light becomes orange light, becomes green light, becomes blue light. If you move very fast towards something that's emitting light. But the universe is emitting light everywhere fairly homogeneously from the cosmic microwave background radiation. If you try to move through that light and you're and you've got 320 eta electron volts worth of energy compelling you along. Your speed is, um, I, I read something that throughout the history of the universe, if this particle had been moving at the speed it was going, um, it would have only seen 16 minutes elapse since the Big Bang. Remember we talked about time dilation when we were talking about relativity. So if you're moving with that speed, not only does time dilate, but the blue shift means that the cosmic microwave background radiation becomes a cosmic gamma ray, micro, a gamma ray background radiation. And if you're a particle trying to swim through a sea of gamma rays, it's not going to end well for you. So there's an upper limit on how much energy something moving through the cosmos unshielded from the cosmic microwave background radiation. There's a limit to how fast it can go, how much energy it can have. And that's about 60 eta electron volts. So we don't know why this thing showed up. We don't know what process created it. We're pretty certain that it couldn't have been a process that was billions of light years away because the, the gamma rays from the cosmic microwave background would have caused this thing to dissipate? It's a big question. Anyway, it was very interesting. I thought I'd throw that in there. So another logical question is how big is the universe? Well, we can see to about 13 billion light years away. But something out here probably also sees 13 billion light years away. So there's no reason to presuppose that what we can see constitutes any kind of natural edge to the universe. Also, the things that were about 13 billion years away when we view the light today have been moving ever since. 
So now those things on the edge of what we're be able to perceive with our telescopes are actually 40 billion light years away. So if somebody asks you how big is the observable universe, the answer is not 13 billion light years, it's 40 billion light years. But it gets kind of, the ideas get a little um, fluid at that point. Perhaps you could answer 13 billion years, that's how far away things are that, that we've received light from, but those things themselves are 40 billion light years away. And the idea is that there's nothing special about this galaxy that happens to be 40 billion light years away today. There's probably galaxies beyond it. And there's this notion called the dark flow that says, well, let's pretend that maybe there's a big clump of galaxies somewhere near some other galaxy that we see near the edge of our observable universe. Wouldn't that create a net gravitational pull on those galaxies local to this clump? We should be able to measure that differential flow, we call it the dark flow, that would tell us unambiguously that there is more matter beyond what we can see. The studies about this are very inconclusive. One of the reasons for that is probably that because the universe is homogeneous, the idea that there could be a very large on cosmic scales, clump of matter um, is relatively low. So the, the evidence on this is unambiguous, but this is one of the first ways that, that uh, we've come up with to try and measure the existence of what might be considered an alternative universe. Remember I said there's no reason to suspect that something 13 billion light years away is at the edge of the universe. Maybe there's 13 billion more years beyond that of observable universe, and maybe beyond that and so on and so on. Why would you ever stop? If the gravity of the universe, the self-gravity of the universe, and the cosmological constant always balance out the amount of matter in the universe, and that zero is always the total answer, then you can have a positive infinity and a negative infinity that cancel. So maybe everything that came into existence during the Big Bang is in some practical sense infinite we will just never be able to interact with it or get to it. Maybe there, if you draw a cosmic horizon around any particular point, this is us, maybe there are many other points in the stuff that came into existence with the Big Bang that have their own cosmological horizon. That's the first kind of multiple universe, this idea that there are vast numbers of other stars and galaxies beyond what we can ever see. And thermodynamic calculations tell us that somewhere in 10 to the 10 to the 29, so that's an un, uh, unimaginably large number of zeros in terms of tri trillions and quintillions and etaillions, whatever the word is, thermodynamics tells us that our nearest twin may be this close. Because if you take the number of ways you can arrange a set of particles, you can only have a finite number of ways. And if you go this far away, you've got a pretty good certainty that you will have arranged a set of particles equal to your mass in a configuration that is equal to your body on a planet identical to Earth. So the fact that the universe may in fact be infinite in a literal sense gives rise to this notion that um, there are copies of everything. Because given an infinite amount of mass and space, you can make as many copies as you want. And because anything that can happen likely will, you'll see a twin. What's the fate of the universe? There's the Big Bang. This is a schematic representation. Uh, here's where we are today. Remember, dark energy is causing the universe to accelerate. The implication being that as the universe accelerates more and more, eventually dark energy, that cosmological constant, will grow to the point where it can, in fact, rip planets away from their stars and rip the atoms out of your body. About 50 times the current age of the universe, the redshift acting upon the cosmic microwave background radiation will cause it to become undetectable, indistinguishable from noise. Dark energy will eventually rip atoms apart. We've got a huge amount of time left to revise our predictions, though, so <laughs> <clears throat> we won't presume to have all the answers immediately.
But we do live at a relatively special time from a cosmological perspective. We can see other galaxies. We can measure the cosmic background radiation. We've, we're so far away from the moment of the Big Bang that carbon and nitrogen and all the other molecules and atoms of life have been able to be formed. And then there's this idea of a quantum multiverse, that the wave function of quantum mechanics that says, uh, is a cat alive or dead? Well, maybe it's both. Hugh Everett, back in the 60s, I believe, came up with this idea that maybe everything that can happen in quantum mechanics does happen. Maybe instead of there being a definite... Uh, thank you. Maybe instead of there being a definite single state of the universe every time a quantum phenomena happens, maybe the universe branches every time a quantum interaction, which is quintillions of times a second for every atom in your body. Maybe that's creating an alternative reality. It's a plausible theory. Like most multi-universe theories, it's hard to measure because we are always stuck in the universe of our own instant. So I uh, talked a little bit about cosmic inflation. You can read that. Uh, it explains the flat, large-scale, homogeneous, small, random structure um, aspects of our universe. It implies that there's more universe beyond our horizon. It directly implies that by virtue of the inflationary theory of cosmology. For the universe we can see, and much of which we can't, inflation very well might have stopped at a random time. One of the things physicists are challenged by is figuring out why inflation stopped the inflationary epoch of the universe. What drove it to stop? It may be that there are other pockets of our meta space-time that were instantiated with the Big Bang that are still inflating, or that inflated somewhat longer than our portion did, or that inflated somewhat less time than our portion did. So space on a higher dimensional, literally higher dimensional scale, may be more like a foam with different parts inflating into bubbles of real universe at different times. And then there's Copernicus' legacy. Copernicus said there's nothing special about us or where we are. At least that's how we've interpreted much of his writing since. And if there's nothing special about where we are, then we look around, we see the speed of light and the charge on the electron and the strength of the weak interaction and all these, remember last time I said there are 26 or so free parameters in our model of nature that we seem to be at liberty to choose. Well, maybe they are completely random. Maybe there is no a priori reason why the constants of nature have the value they do in our universe. Maybe there are all kinds of universes with different constants of nature, most of which would never be able to support stars and life. So this foam, this quantum multiverse, this thermodynamic multiverse, and now we've got this inflationary universe and perhaps another idea that other Big Bangs with their own infinite number of progeny from it, their own inflating universes might have happened at other points, as it were, in this meta-manifold. Mind-blowing. Is it philosophy or is it physics? Until we can measure it, it's probably more of the latter. But it's not implausible. I'm sorry, more of the former. All right. So I have something um, I want to read at the conclusion of this one-year journey. I speak fairly, fairly well, but I think I write better than I speak, so I'm going to read this to you, and hopefully the slideshow will keep you entertained while I'm, I've got my head down. Since the beginning is always the best place to start, the first subject in this series was the Big Bang. With that topic, we learned how surprising the universe is. We learned that it happened everywhere, compelling space to expand <coughs> and matter to cool over cosmic time. We encountered many jarring surprises about our literal and figurative place in an expansive and expanding cosmos. In our species' childhood, scholars dreamed that our planet 
was the greatest and grandest thing in the cosmos, aside from the heavenly spheres to which were attached the diminutive moon and sun, and the scintillating infinitesimal but seemingly countless stars. We, or more properly our ancestors, discovered that contrary to the narrative born of our self-centered notions and derived from our several animal senses, that we instead inhabited a gargantuan cosmos wherein the sun is a titanic ball of nuclear fire among billions of others. Barely a century ago, our species discovered through clever instruments and ingenious surmising that these other stellar fires moving in their trackless pirouettes comprise an awesome pinwheel of brilliant light spinning with magisterial power in a sea of darkness. We are, in fact, looking out at the cosmos from around a speck-like star in a single raft of a hundred billion stars floating in an ocean of night. And we are not alone. Surprisingly, we found a hundred billion or more essentially similar rafts of stars, galaxies distant and unfathomably different from our own. Today, we have concluded our first voyage of wonder. We have wandered to the edges of knowable space, impelled by wonder, driven by imagination, and bounded by evidence of what is possible and real. We have followed the geometry of space itself and uncovered beautiful symmetries that give force to nature while guaranteeing that enough things never change to keep the world predictable and generally constant through time. We've seen how mathematics and geometry first used to quantitatively describe our universe have given rise to a brand new predictions about what we should be able to measure, predictions that have been borne out. When combining mathematics with the symmetrical conservation of the speed of light, scientists have deduced and subsequently confirmed that our everyday world, experienced at everyday speeds, transforms into an unanticipated reality where progress, or the progress of clocks and the extent of rulers, the very fabric of space and time, become mutable and relative. We've seen that predicting and apprehending reality does not necessarily mean that we can comprehend it. The mysteries of quantum mechanics still challenge our best philosophers who haven't yet quite put to rest what it all means. Together, we zoomed in on the atom where symmetry theories and quantum mechanics combine to populate a microcosm intuitively inaccessible but manifestly wonderful. The wheeling galaxies and intermittently buzzing atoms have always been there for us to explore. They have continued their various courses while our civilizations have matured and as we have begun to learn to temper fantasy and myth with fact and measurement. By applying our remarkable intellect and building wondrous instruments of manipulation and appraisal, we have constructed an ever more complete model of nature in our collective consciousness, a model exhibiting ever greater fidelity with ever greater internal consistency. From our middling place between a gargantuan cosmos and a puzzling microcosmos, we have presumed to learn the secrets of nature Nature has rewarded our study with technology, technology that we use to diagnose tumors, to locate ourselves on the surface of the earth, to communicate across the globe, and to enrich our lives with a bounty derived from the practical application of the wonders we've discovered. Our generation and numberless generations of our forebears have contemplated our place in the cosmos. For almost all of history, we believed we were at its center, set upon a pinnacle or at least a pedestal, as seemed intuitively reasonable. And then Copernicus gave us a great shove and we've been tumbling down ever since. Copernicus' notion has even compelled us to invent the idea of multiple universes to keep this one from being magically special. You might think that with each discovery we seem to be tumbling toward irrelevancy. Some people are bothered by this, by the loneliness, by this cosmic irrelevancy. With downcast eyes, far too many consign their future to bored emptiness. I entreat you, my friends, to instead lift your heads and bask in the opportunities for discovery, for self-enrichment, and for the countless ways scientific knowledge can enrich and enhance 
our ability to care for one another, for our planet, and for ourselves. Next year, the quest continues, and we will move away from the cosmic and focus more on earthly wonders. We will spend not inconsiderable time on the mysteries of life science from its origin to development. We will also cover topics relevant to day-to-day -day life, such as economics and political theory. From there, the discussion meanders to the philosophy of science and the acquired skill of critical thinking. We wrap up with a selection of perplexing, unsolved scientific mysteries. As I said at the beginning of this series, and as I have reiterated nearly every program since, all the evidence of nature compels us to confront the truth that we are in this world alone, excepting the seven billion or so others like us. The clear implication is that insofar as our planet remains livable, our society remains just, our fellow living beings thrive, and our lives remain bountiful and joyful, it is up to us and our several billions of friends to make it so. Science is not a thing remote and dry. It is the filter we use to separate the plausible from the pretend, the possible from the preposterous. Science delights and surprises and forces us to expand our concepts of reality. Science helps us uncover the problems we face, from the cosmic to the terrestrial, even those personal and self-inflicted. It tells us about unavoidable trade-offs between progress and pollution, between creation and destruction. But it also inspires us to dream of new ways to solve or reduce those problems. And when we can't make everything we dislike go away, it informs us about the options and opportunities that lay beyond the crises we confront. It bounds our fertile and spectacularly creative imagination to the real world and uses evidence to guide our quest for a better future. Thank you for joining me on this year's quest. <laughs>